I don't know if I told you this before, but I, I recently got married myself. So I was- Good wishes. Basically, now my life is supposed to be bad. That's what we learn from fairy tales and folk tales, right? Right, if it were a folk tale, now would be the point at which bad things start happening. So when did Happily Ever After turn into weddings and marriage? It was about 1550 when the first real fairy tales, the kind we think of as fairy tales in the modern world, the first time they came into existence. Now, if we put ourselves in a place like Venice, which is where the first fairy tales came into existence, there were a lot of poor people, and getting married was, was an achievement. Getting married would need money, so why not think about getting married to a king or a queen? The idea of a commoner marrying royalty picked up steam because it was making the impossible possible. Because this didn't ever happen. There's not no... only did it not happen, there were laws against it in Venice. In 1528, a law was passed that a noble could not marry legally a poor person outside that caste of nobility. It shows the extent to which a fairy tale is really a fantasy response to a widespread wish or hope. Well, that kind of sounds nice. And I feel like it worked because now at this point, we're seeing commoners marrying royals. We're seeing Meghan Markle marry Prince Harry. And that's like something that never would have happened. Not in 1550s. <laughs> no, no, no. It was a time when women began to lose economic power. It was a time when large capital ventures came about in which women couldn't participate because they required traveling, going far from home. And it was a time when, for instance, institutions like Beguinage were put out of business. Beguinage was a place, it was kind of a condominium for about 9, 10, 11, 12 women. And there they could live in a safe place and ply their trade and live independently. Oh, Beguinage nice. were, were closed all over Western Europe between 1450 and 1550, so that was another way in which women lost economic independence. And this whole idea of a heroine who had to be saved by a man, by a prince, preferably, came into being. And at the end of this period, that's when the fairy tale heroine mm -hmm. emerges and fairy tales with her. Today, we think about fairy tales, we think about Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, it's fairy tales in general, growing up with them, they, they sound so romantic, wedding is ultimate happy ending. Do you think that puts too much pressure on the wedding? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I do. I came out of the 50s and 60s, and also video cameras didn't exist then. Oh, right. You so, couldn't Instagram so anything. So wedding wasn't a, an event that could be communicated to your friends or, or even memorialized in mm -hmm. film, unless you were royalty. There's been a steady development of the commercial aspects of wedding. There's an, are there are lots of profits to be made, so the dreams get bigger. But the dreams are really nurtured by the Disney films, which are the latest version of fairy tales. And we have to take them very seriously because they reach everybody. So in these stories, we're seeing Cinderella. It's always ending with the marriage, how she earns the happily ever after is changing. What's the thread of uh, how Cinderella changes as time Cinderella, progresses? You might be surprised that the Cinderella character speaks less and less and less over time. This first Cinderella figure is a tough little girl. She gets moralized by Perrault, and she gets even more moralized and Christianized mm. by Grimm. And then Disney comes and takes away some of the ugliness of the story and introduces a lot of signature elements, such as uh, birds and animals that contribute to... Helping her get ready. Uh, yeah. Really fashionable <laughs> yeah. mice. <laughs> yes. That's what they contribute. In yeah. the Disney film, a lot of things that Cinderella actually says in the fairy tales, the written, published fairy tales, are, are taken over by birds. And, uh, <laughs> so That's really, so, what does that say about women, honestly? Well, <laughs> it's kind of depressing. Mm -hmm. And then the story ends at the wedding. There is no more. There is That's no it. more, right. That's it. That's supposed to be the moment that defines the rest of her life.
but that's changed now, right? It's Ruth, changed. has it changed? It's yes, changed, it right? It has changed okay. because there's a whole new field of anti fairy tales, of revised fairy tales. Oh, okay. And especially for young adults who are who might be approaching marriage in the next five to ten years of their life, the revised fairy tales have very different kinds of endings and they don't necessarily lead to weddings. That undermines the <laughs> The general thrust. That's good. Of uh, the idea of a fairy tale wedding with poofy sleeves and, and a huge skirt. Maybe our, the next generation growing up with these anti fairy tales will feel maybe a little less pressure to have the perfect wedding. Could be. Could be. <laughs> We're not in a position to know. We, we, we can't see <laughs> the future. You're that. right. We're not magic fairy eagle princesses. It's good to hear that fairy tales have changed over time. And I hope that they keep on changing to be better to women and let them speak more. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and I think they will, because fairy tales are really a responsive kind of literature. They pick up, mm -hmm. they express widespread hopes, and that's why certain fairy tales remain over hundreds of years. And the wedding part is still a happy ending. And I mean, I got married, so it got me.